right, so we are in the book of Joshua, and as we go through this book, I kind of have a plan of how I want to do it, how I want to teach everything in here, and I've kind of got three things that I want to accomplish and I want to focus on as we go through this book. And first off, I just want us to be familiar with all the stories that are recorded. It's important that we know these stories. Uh, they're great stories, and uh, also we'll make life application on these stories. That's why these things are given. They are written for our admonition. We're supposed to learn from these things and apply them in our day and in our situation. But the third thing I, I want to kind of focus on, and I, I'm hoping to do a little bit of this as we go through the book, we'll definitely probably cover it when we get into some of the chapters where it's just kind of like all this doing is like uh, laying out information, like who took what part of the land. It's like a lot of names and it's the kind of reading that you often look at and then you just kind of, your mind goes other places. Okay. Does that ever happen to anybody when you're reading some parts of the Bible? Well, here's the thing about that. While that happens to all of us, we do need to understand that all those things are there for a reason. And if we, when we understand why these stories are in the Bible, it will really help us just know how to interpret the Bible a little better because I'm noticing more and more a lot of doctrinal errors that people make, just a lot of these like face palming moments that you have when you're listening to preaching. It's just because people don't, they often just don't understand the situation and what was going on from the passage that they're reading. You know, they're reading a verse and the words that are stated in that verse, you know, it sounds pretty good and it sounds like it's going along with whatever it is they're wanting to teach. But then they'll go and they'll take that verse and they'll just do crazy weird things with it. And it's just like, wait a minute, H hang on a second. I get it. That verse does say what you just said it said, but here's why it was saying that. And, and, it, it, and it, the way you are applying it in this situation does not work. You are butchering the scripture. And, you know, we got a lot of just novice preachers out there. You know, we've all done it before. But then uh, a lot of it, too, is because of just uh, dispensational teaching, too. Um, you know, and let me just say this about dispensational truth. Do you know, not everything that dispensationalists say is false. Okay. But understand, in the dispensational mindset, there are major flaws within there. So, and because of that, it causes them to just kind of go crazy with a lot of things. And uh, it's kind of like one of those deals too, where if, have you ever known like a preacher or somebody that's out there, that maybe they kind of have a little bit of an extreme position on something, but it's not real far off or real unbalanced, but then their followers take it and go even crazier with it. Okay. We've all seen that before, haven't we? Well, that's what they do with dispensations a lot of times too, is, you know, some of the stuff was, you know, some of the stuff in dispensation is just really bad, even in, Clar you know, Clarence Larkin's version. But you have people that have taken that and gone even crazier with it, like the Ruckmanites. And uh, that kind of thing often happens. And at the end of the day, what everybody has to do is you have to rightly divide the truth, word, the word of truth. In other words, you have to learn how to figure out where all these verses apply. And you got to do the work yourself. And dispensational truth, all these books about dispensation is somebody else doing the work for you. And then a lot of times while they were going off some template that somebody else used, they'll teach something that the guy who wrote that book would never teach. And, and so that will always happen too. If you all just rightly divide the word of truth, like I tell you it should be done and you don't do the work yourself, you will take information that I give you but then you'll apply it incorrectly and you'll end up teaching something weird in my name. And I don't want to do that. And I don't, I don't want you all doing that. So we got to watch out for these things, but I'm hoping to kind of show a lot of these things as we go through this book to help us understand, um, you know, how to interpret these things. And we'll, and we'll uh, look at uh, one example in particular here real soon. But uh, those are kind of the three things that I want to do. So let's go and start reading and notice in verse one, it says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses's minister saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people under the land, which I do get, give to them, even to the children 
of Israel. Now, something that is very important that you understand as a student of the Bible about Moses is the, is first off who he was. Okay. Not just the stories about him. Okay. We all know about how Pharaoh was going to kill all the male children. Moses' mom spared him. We all know that. We all know the things that we learn from watching the 10 commandments. We know about the plagues. We know about the parting of the Red Sea, the smiting of the rock. We know all those stories, but do you understand who this man was? Understand this man, Moses, he was, he wasn't just a great man. He was not just the pastor of the church in the wilderness. Okay. He wasn't just like a pastor. All right. Moses outranks pastors big time. Okay. Despite what some of your I have pastors are going to want to make you think now it's okay if we take principles from that. Okay. But you know what? If I ever marry an Ethiopian woman, you come yell at me. I, and I, I don't think you'll turn into a leper. Okay. I don't think I carry that kind of juice. All right. But at the same time, you know, you can still get some things from that, but preachers go overboard with that quite a bit. We got to watch out for that. But let me tell you exactly who Moses was. Okay. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. This is so important. It says the Lord, thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me. This is Moses speaking. He said unto him shall ye hearken. You should probably underline that verse in your Bible because that is a key verse right there and understand Moses. He was a picture of Jesus Christ. He was a type of Jesus Christ. He was not as good as Jesus Christ. He was not Jesus Christ, but he was a type of Jesus Christ. And not only that, Moses, when you hear, see the name Moses mentioned in the new Testament, it's not always just talking about the man, but you know what it's talking about? It's talking about the books of Moses. It's talking about Genesis through Deuteronomy. Do you know what Genesis through Deuteronomy is? You know what the books of Moses or Moses is? It's kind of like you could say, and if we might may make a comparison, our constitution of the United States of America, it's like, he was like the founding father. Okay. But it was just Moses and understand when Moses leads them out of Egypt, God is trying to start a nation. God is trying to raise up a nation of people that will be his people that one day will be sanctified and that one day he will physically dwell with them. And these people too, in the meantime, he was going to dwell with them in a tabernacle, but God wanted to, I mean, fully dwell with them one of these days. And so God is raising up a people to do that, a people to make a covenant with. It started with Abraham, but a lot of, you know, Abraham, he was just kind of a wanderer in the wilderness. He was a stranger in a strange land. Isaac, Jacob, they dwelt in tents. During Jacob's time, they ended up going to Egypt. They were in captivity for over 400 years. But now God is ready to get this nation started. God's ready to establish them in the land. And God is going to use Moses not only to bring them out of Egypt and out of captivity and to bring them into the promised land, but God is also going to use Moses to give them a law. A law that they were to live by as a people. A law that was not going to change until... A prophet like Moses came along from their own brethren. And guess who that prophet was? It was Jesus Christ. So when this, what we see going on here though in Joshua's day, because of Moses and his sin of smiting the rock, okay, because of that, God does not allow Moses to bring them into the promised land. And so, uh, that part of them going into the promised land is not going to be fulfilled in Moses' lifetime, but it was still Moses that gave them the law and is kind of his last order uh, to Joshua was to take them into the promised land. And so as soon as Moses is dead, God tells them, go into the promised land. And what's about to happen is God is about to begin a brand new era. Israel is about to enter a whole new era where they are going to be a nation but it's going to start out when they go into that promised land, it's going to start out where there's going to be battles. They have to possess the land. They've got to drive out the Canaanites, which is what we're seeing in this, in the book of Joshua. We are seeing Israel go into the promised land and conquer the land. That's pretty much what this book is really all about. Cause this is major what's happening. Cause God is 
starting a nation here that is supposed to continue doing what they're doing until that prophet comes along. That prophet, Jesus Christ. And so understand that Moses, he was, he was a major figure. He was the founding father, you could say. What he wrote, it was their constitution. It was the law of their land. So this guy carries a lot of weight. Okay, This guy carries a lot more weight than just a pastor of a local church. He's a really big deal. And it's important that we understand that, how big of a deal he was. And Joshua now, though, he's taking up the mantle. He's the leader in this nation. But guess what? He's still subject to Moses and to Moses' law. He's still subject to what Moses had written down. That's what he's supposed to follow. So even though Joshua is the new leader, Joshua, he is not as high up as Moses. Okay, and keep that in mind because that's, I'm not going to have time to get into that on Sunday night, but just keep that in mind, okay? Joshua, he's the new leader, but he does not equal Moses, okay? That's just the important thing that we need to understand. And in Acts chapter 7, in verse 36, it says, He brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord, your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he talking about Jesus that was with the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles given unto us. Now, this is a great passage, too, for the Jehovah's Witnesses that want to act like Jesus isn't God and that Jesus isn't Jehovah. But understand, right here, Stephen is preaching to the Jews who rejected Jesus Christ, who thought they were obeying the law, who thought they were followers of Moses. And Stephen is calling them out, reminding them of that verse in Deuteronomy, saying, the Lord is going to raise a prophet like unto Moses. Moses said to listen to him when he comes along. Oh, no, we can't go against our Constitution. You're not going against the Constitution. The Constitution said to listen to that prophet. And, so, and that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's showing them that you're not violating Moses by following Christ. You're doing exactly what Moses said to do. Because, I mean, think about that, too. Okay, now, our Constitution obviously is not near as cool as the Bible. It's not near as great as as the Bible, as the law of Moses. It's not perfect. It's not divine. It doesn't have prophecy and all those things in it. But what if there was something that was really cool in there that was written telling us that one of these days, you know, someone was going to come along, you know, something prophetic, you know, an orange man with weird hair, you know, and uh, who is going to be removed from office unjustly. But then one day he was just going to show back up like everybody's telling us is going to happen. And when he does, <laughs> y'all do what he says. <laughs> and now, and, and then all of a sudden that happens. Then would we be violating the Constitution if we listened to, to that? No, actually, we'd be doing what it said to do, wouldn't it? Okay, now, obviously, man is never going to come up with something that cool. But this is the word of God we're talking about here. But I just say all that to say, though, while for a lot of people, it would be hard because, you know, what if after Trump, you know, shows back up and sure enough, I mean, this is what the Constitution said. We have to listen to him. And then Trump says, your Second Amendment's gone. Wait a minute. That's in the Constitution. Well, yeah, but it also says in the Constitution, when that guy comes along, you got to listen to him. And, and so the, th the truth is, we would probably have a crowd of people that would want to rebel against that and then think that they were the old time religion crowd. You know, we're just following the constitution. No, actually you're not following the constitution because it said when this guy came along to listen to him. And so that's what went on during Jesus day. You had a crowd of people who said, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to listen to Moses. But the truth is they weren't listening to Moses because they, if they would have listened to Moses, they would have listened to Jesus Christ. And you know what? 
That is exactly what Jesus was talking about in John 5, 45, when it says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. So Jesus said, you trust in Moses. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So these people thought they were trusting in Moses. They said they trusted in Moses, but Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you believe me because he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe not my words? They didn't believe Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. They didn't believe that verse because Jesus was that fulfillment. He was that one like Moses. So if Jesus comes along and this, this is what people sometimes do too, when they're reading the new Testament, it's like they got to twist the scriptures to make it look like well, you know, Jesus wasn't really, uh, you know, violating anything. Like, for example, you know, when he like wasn't keeping the Sabbath and things like that. Well, here's the thing about that. Jesus outranks Moses. In fact, you know, again, if Jesus says something that's different than what Moses said, it's actually not contradicting Moses because Moses said, listen to him. So it's the same thing. If I tell my kids to do something, and then, and, and I give them instructions, but then, you know, and maybe I tell them a bedtime or something, but I was like, now, if your mom tells you something a little different, listen to your mom. Okay. If they go, if then I go away and while I'm away, if she does, if she kind of changes things up a little bit, well, I authorized her to do that, didn't I? And they can't say, well, I'm going to listen to dad. And he said, you know, we can go to bed at nine o'clock. No, actually dad also said, if I change it, you have to listen to me. So the truth is, you know, she, she has that authority. Well, the books of Moses, it backed up Jesus' authority to change some, th some things and to do some things a little different. So the truth is, Jesus can't violate the law. Okay? Obviously, Jesus can't go against anything that's holy. It's not like Jesus was going to go sin and do something bad. But at, at the end of the day, um, Jesus, because, you know, even, even if theoretically... Even if he didn't outrank Moses, okay, he still has authorization from Moses to change things. It's right there in Deuteronomy 18, 15. So it's always important that we understand that, and especially too, if you feel like there's something that just needs to be reconciled between the New Testament and the Old Testament. No, Jesus can change things according to the Old Testament. And so we're going to go with what Jesus said. So if Jesus said we didn't have to worry about the Sabbath and holy days and the uh, uh, meats and drinks and divers washings and all those things. We're not going to worry about those things and we can eat bacon and not be violating the law of Moses because the law of Moses said to listen to Jesus. So that this is an important thing that people need to understand that uh, about Moses and a lot of people uh, they're, they're not getting this and it causes them sometimes to just do some weird things with the scriptures that we don't need to do. And notice too, how Stephen also said, about this prophet when and when he was talking about jesus that it was jesus that was with the church in the wilderness okay? and that is that's huge that is stephen saying jesus is god and use that on jehovah's witnesses that's you, when they say that he's not jehovah stephen said it was him that was with the church in the wilderness what, what are you going to do with that Okay. There's not, nothing you can do except, except the fact that Jesus Christ is in fact God. So verse 3 of Joshua says, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, under the great sea, toward the going down to the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all thy, all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Now he's talking about jo to Joshua right here. Okay. And when he's talking to Joshua, he's telling him, nobody's going to be able to stand against you. Okay. You're going to, you're going to win these battles. And he said, be strong and of good courage for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance, the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So while God promised this land to Israel, here's something else that's very important legally that we need to understand about the Bible and about the promises and about the lands is just because 
God said, it's yours. That right there doesn't necessarily automatically make it theirs. All right. Unless, because God said, you have to go get it. Y'all understand that? Just God making the statement, it belongs to you. Okay. That's God. And, and when you look at the context and everything God's been telling Joshua, that's God saying, it's kind of like if you're going to go play a basketball game and you know, it's like, we got this. You know what you're saying? We're, we're going to beat these people, but you still have to go play the game, don't you? And so God tells them, you got this. The land's yours. I'm going to be with you. I will help you drive these people out, but they still have to go drive them out, don't they? Y'all understand that? It's very important that you understand that because here's the thing too. When it comes to land, you can't really claim it unless you take it, unless you possess it, unless you subdue it. You can't really claim it. In Exodus chapter 23, when God is, uh, this is before Moses has sinned, uh, before they've basically been condemned to 40 years in the wilderness, God's speaking here and he says, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea, even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert under the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. So if God would have just driven all of them out at once, you know, he could have sent the hornets in there or whatever, and he could have driven them all out of land that way, diseases or whatever. The problem is it takes time to kind of possess a land, take it over, to do all the things to do with the upkeep and everything. And so the, and so the thing is, God told him, I'm not just going to do this in one year. Cause if we do, the beasts are going to take over. Things are going to become overgrown. The land will just kind of be a mess and it won't be any good to you. So it's something that's going to be done little by little. It's not just going to automatically just boom. I snap, we, I snap my finger and it's now yours. No, you have to go drive those people out of the land. You have to go take possession. You have to subdue that land. So let me ask you this. They were in that land. Okay. Now we all know the history, but they were out of that land for roughly 1900 years. Okay. Now here's a, so is it theirs anymore? No. And that place became a wilderness. Now I get it. They've come back and they have, you know, and since they've come back too. You know, because of the blessing of the Jews, right? Maybe because of their technology and all the money we give them, you know, that land has blossomed again. I remember uh, somebody showed me a picture. It was in an old Bible of what they call the Mount of Beatitudes that I went to when I was in Israel. And it was like just this barren hill with nothing on it. Now it's just like a beautiful mountain with trees and flowers. It's just, it's, it's, it's beautiful now. It's all green there. And it's like that in a lot of places in Israel. I mean, it is actually pretty impressive. Some of the things that they've done with the land, they know what they're doing on a lot of stuff there, especially building walls. They know how to build walls, uh, over in Israel. They're really good at that too. But here's the thing. So why is the land theirs now? Because they took it. Okay. They don't have it because God promised it to them back then. Okay? They have it because they took it to the victors go the spoils. And you know what they're doing now? They're still slowly trying to get the rest of it. They're trying to choke the Palestinians out. But because of like the UN and all the international things going on, it's, you know, they haven't been able to fully take it. If they had their way, they would. They could get rid of the Palestinians probably just like that. You know, they, but because of just international law, all that stuff, it, it's really complicated. But at the same time, you know, I'll concede you know, the fact that it does kind of belong to them now in many ways, just because they took it over. And you say, well, I, I don't agree with that. Well, I hope that's the case. Otherwise, we just need to give the Indians back everything. If it's just like who had it first or something like that. But he, when the Indians had it, most of it was a wilderness, wasn't it? And, and you don't just get to go and walk across the land and say, it's mine. Dude, you have to actually do something with it. And you know what? Even today, 
you know, if, if we just, if I did, if I just went and bought a ton of land somewhere and I did nothing with it, if the day came where society, our community decided they need it, you know, they would take it. They'd probably give me something for it, but especially when I'm doing nothing with it, do I really have the right to just claim it as mine? No, that's, that's not really how these things work. And it's not how it worked back then. But, but either way you look at it, God did promise them the land, but that promise did not magically make it theirs. That was God saying that just like you got this, we're going to win this game. They still had to go and they still had to conquer it. They had to drive out the Canaanites. And then you know what else they had to do? They also had to obey God. They had to do, they had to keep that law. Otherwise God said, I'll drive you out. And guess what? They didn't keep God's law. And you know what? God did exactly what he said. So you know what that means? Land's not theirs anymore. They don't just have this title, this unchanging title to the land because of that promise back then. That doesn't even make sense with what God promised then under the Old Testament. They had to be in the land. They had to take care of it. They had to obey God. They didn't. So what happened? They lost it. And if they have it back at all today, it's not because of God's blessing. It's just because they beat the Palestinians. That's pretty much, that's pretty much all there is to it. So that's an important thing to understand about how this works. And especially too, when you're listening to some dispensationalists, read these verses and then like applying it to today. And when you realize what is actually being said right here, it really does. It just, it's a major face palm moment when you hear that kind of thing. So verse seven says only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant commanded thee turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So Joshua, he's the new leader, isn't he? He's the new sheriff in town, but he's not allowed to turn from the law of Moses to the right hand or the left hand. So who outrank? So who, who's higher rank Moses or Joshua? Moses. Okay. It's, it's, it's Moses that outranks Joshua. He's got to follow that law of Moses and this prospering. God didn't say you're going to prosper because you're a Jew. God said, no, you're going to prosper if you'll do what I told you to do. If you don't turn to the right hand and folks, this, this is what you got to understand right now. The, all this, these stories that we see in the Old Testament, we are seeing the results of them not obeying God. Okay, when God, God told them, you'll prosper if you don't turn to the right hand and the left hand. So you know what we're reading? All these stories we're going to read, we're going to see them depart to the right hand and the left hand. And then you know what we're going to see? Bad things happen as a result of it. Exactly like God said. Everybody just wants to like just isolate a little promise of God and they want to throw out all the contingencies that are in there. There's a lot of contingencies in there, and those words are just as important. Okay? That's why you have to use the entire Bible. So they were not allowed to amend this law that was given until the prophet came, Jesus Christ. So every problem that they ever had was because of disobedience. So verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, uh, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. This book of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, you need to meditate on it. It needs to be in your heart, because if you do, if you'll meditate on these things, if we make it a part of you and who you are, you will have success. You will be prosperous. This law that God gave, and here's another important thing you got to understand. The law that God gave was only going to work if it was in their hearts. Say, well, isn't it going to be okay if we just obey it? No, it needs to be in your heart too. And look what it says in Ezekiel 44 verse six it says, and thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it. Even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat, and the blood, 
And they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of my unholy things, but have set keepers of my charge in the sanctuary for yourselves. Thus saith the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in the flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. God, and, and we see this a lot too. We're not going to go to all the passages. God said, you need to circumcise the foreskin of your heart. There were certain things that the Jews had down in the flesh. Okay. They had the circumcision in the flesh down, but you know what they didn't have? The circumcision of the heart. They, they did not have that down at all. They were doing that one thing. And every, every group, every church, every religion, every wing of the IFB has that one area where they're better than everybody else. And you know what they do? They make it the thing to lift themselves up anytime it says anything about it. Okay. In our circles, it's we're better soul owners than everybody else. So we can have just a major beam in our eye. Yeah, well, at least we're soul owners. You know, our tracks don't have the word repent anywhere in them. You know, we're more clear in the gospel than you are. You know, we're immoral. We're jerks. You know, we've got all these major problems, but we're better soul winners than these other people that are more godly and loving and have a good relationship with the Lord. You know, it, it's like that everywhere. Okay. Some places I've been in, I know there's some groups out there. It's about the music. Their music's more godly than everybody else's. And, and they have no, and a lot of these, those churches have like no soul winning in those churches. Okay. Now, just because we have soul winning, it doesn't give us an excuse to go liberal on our music. Okay. And you know, then you have some people, they're more conservative than everybody else in dress. Okay. And because you know, they dress better than the rest of us, you know, they, you know, they just declare that the most important thing. Okay. So it's like that folks in the IFB, every group in the IFB has their thing where they're better than everybody else. But at the end of the day, you know what? You can have certain things down and folks, it's good to have soul winning down. It's good to have good music and it's good to have good. Music. All those things are good, but if it's not in your heart, God don't care. God wants us to love him. God wants us to love our neighbor. If you're not doing those two things, you stink. No matter how good your music is, no matter how, how much you have these things down, God has always wanted this. Stephen in Acts seven in verse 51, he said, ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. Okay, folks, it's not about crossing something off the checklist. Great. You went out sewing on Saturday. Congratulations. That's not all there is to the Christian life. That's not all that God wants from us. That doesn't make you a good Christian. The things that God has called us to do are things that the, the real reason God wants us doing all these things is God's trying to draw us closer to him. But often people will take these things and yet, and they'll do these things, but they do it as just a way to browbeat other people. They do it a way to lift themselves up with pride and it doesn't get them any closer to God. I've known some people that were very godly, you could say in certain areas, but they were just mean, wicked people. We were, I was with Brother Lonnie one time at McDonald's. We were in there listening to some Pentecostal lady dressed more conservative than any of you ladies here in the church. You probably think all y'all were Jezebels, but you know what? This lady was in there on the phone just gossiping horribly about some woman in their church. We're just listening. It was just, man, this is bad. She was like talking about how she can't believe the pastor's going to let her sing in church because when she sings, it's not of the spirit. Pastor should let this other lady sing because when she sings, it's of the spirit. And she's just, I mean, just hammering this woman while she's there in her long skirt, no makeup, you know, hair in a bun, the whole nine yards like the Pentecostal women, but just vicious, viciously gossiping. Do you think she was impressing God with her clothes there while she's talking about that woman that way? Oh, well, you know, at least I don't dress like a Jezebel. Yeah, but you act like a Jezebel. Man, you're, you're, man, what a, what a horrible person. We're just sitting there just like, man, I don't want to go to that church. That's all, that's all I could think when, when I, when I heard her. And that's how a lot of people are in, in every group. And folks, it's about getting the heart down, about get the, get these heart things right. So verse nine says, have not I commanded thee, uh, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed for the Lord thy God is with thee. 
whithersoever thou goest. Israel, they had no reason to fear any defeat. So verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days, ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land, which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And so three days, he says, we're crossing Jordan. And you know what's interesting? This was something that should have happened 40 years earlier. Okay. That what was happening right here, it, this is what God wanted to happen 40 years ago, not long after they crossed the Red Sea. But y'all remember what happened? 12 of them went to spy and Canaan, 10 were bad, two were good. Remember that? And as a result of that, 40 years in the wilderness. Those 10 spies come back, everybody starts crying like babies because they didn't trust the God who parted the Red Sea. They didn't trust the God who brought them out of Egypt. And God said, 40 years in this wilderness, every one of you that's over 20, you're going to die in the wilderness. Your children, your children that you said would be a prey, they'll go, in the, they'll go into the promised land, but your carcasses are going to rot out here. And, but, and so the thing is though, that judgment's over now. That judgment's over three days and they're crossing Jordan. Should have happened a long time ago. And I think there's a great principle there too, that as, uh, you know, as Christians, okay, after we get saved, that doesn't guarantee we're going to live a victorious life. If we don't believe and trust the God who saved us from our sins, who saved us from hell, if we don't trust him, you know what? Why is God going to give us victory in life? Why is gonna, God's going to let us be successful in our life? And you know, so what, what about all these people that, you know, get saved out soul winning and never get in church, and don't get baptized and all that? Well, same thing as the people who came out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt, but they died in the wilderness. They didn't get to go in the promised land. And the promised land, it's not heaven. Okay? It's just the victorious Christian life. And people, when they get saved, if they don't get in church, if they don't get baptized, if they don't obey the Lord, they're still going to go to heaven. You know, they're not going to go to hell, but they're not going to have a victorious life. They're going to miss out on a lot of great and wonderful blessings. And that's why we do want to try to get people in church. That's why you, if you're saved, you want to stay in church and you want to be obedient to God because you want to receive those blessings. And so it's time now. God's ready to go. And so, and I, and I love it because, you know, in the next chapters, we're going to see how they go. And we don't see anybody doubting this time. They did. They learned their lesson. If I was Joshua, I'd have had some of my best archers or spear throwers right there. It's like, all right, when I make this announcement, if anybody even starts to look worried, shoot them. All right, right there. You know, just finish them right there. I'm not doing 40 years of that wilderness again. It's time to go into the promised land. But I don't think you need, I don't think they needed to do that, but. It would have been pretty cool if they would have. But anyway, verse 12 says, And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord hath given your brethren rest as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God give, giveth them. Then ye shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side, Jordan, towards the sun rising. And this is reference to these, these tribes. They all, God gave them land that was on the other side of that Jordan River. They had already taken that. They had already possessed that. And so they're kind of in a situation in those tribes where they're already setting up camp, building houses, getting farms. You know, they're in, they're in a situation where they can be comfortable, but it wasn't time for them to be comfortable because God uh, wanted Israel united during this time and God wanted them possessing all that land. So Joshua tells them, hey, God's given you this land, but we've got more to go get first. You can leave your wives and everything there, but you come with us as we go take care of these people and then you can go back and then you can enjoy that land. And so... It says in verse 16, and they answered Joshua saying, all that thou commandest us, uh, we will do. And with, whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go according as we hearken unto Moses in all things. So will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee 
as he was with Moses, whosoever he be, that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of a good courage. So this generation, okay, and the generation of Joshua, and as we go through this book, we're going to see mistakes. But really the mistakes that we see, uh, while some of them have some pretty severe consequences, understand that they actually did pretty good. When you consider Israel's history, okay, this was probably the greatest generation that they had. Because as a whole, while there was slight variations, and they paid for those variations, this generation followed the Lord. They served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. And this was, if, if you had to live during a time in Israel, this would be the time to live in. They're getting victory after victory. Great things are happening. Just like God said, if they would obey him. And then you got the book of Judges where it's just all downhill after that. Just one, one bad thing after, after another. But here, so, so let me add this too. I'll probably talk more about this later on. But for example, so um, one of the things I'm hoping to get to as we go through this book too is, you know, some of the uh, treatment of these, you know, the Hittites and the Canaanites seems pretty severe. A lot of people get offend, very offended when they read these passages, say they kill everybody, kill the women and children, they get really offended by that. Okay? Uh, we're going to explain all that. Okay? You, don't, you shouldn't get offended by that. Okay? In fact, you know, it should make you very thankful for grace when you read those stories. Okay? There, there was nothing unjust about that. Oh, the Bible's just full of genocide. Well, we'll, and, and we'll talk about that. But the story of Achan. Okay? How many have ever read the story of Achan just thought, and this was, that was a little cruel. I mean, he just, he took a few things. All these people died. You're, we're going to, after all these victories, you're going to let him lose one battle over just one guy doing something wrong. And then we're going to kill his entire family and everything that he has. That seems kind of extreme. What's going on? You know what's going on? God is showing them how serious it is to Go to the right hand or the left, like he said not to do. These laws were not given just to control Israel. They were given to protect them. Because if they start to go to the right hand or the left, you know what is eventually going to happen? Eventually, they're going to be doing things like sacrificing their children to Moloch. And they did that, didn't they? They were going to have diseases in the land. There was going to be famines in the land. There were going to be things where thousands of people were going to die. And so God, he would make very big examples of people to warn them about the dangers of disobeying God. This was God being merciful. They needed this. I know it seems severe, but at the end of the day, this was meant to save lives. And it's kind of the same thing we see in the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. Hey, oh man, I mean, they still gave most of the money. You know, and it was theirs. I mean, yeah, they told a little fib and we're really going to kill them in church. Why are we doing this? You know why? God was showing right away early on in the early stage of the church. Don't mess with the Holy Ghost. Don't lie to the Holy Ghost. Now, God's not going to go. God shouldn't have to go killing people every time they lie in church, every time they do something to grieve the Holy Ghost. But you know why God was doing that? Because when we grieve the Holy Ghost, when we lie to the Holy Ghost, when we disobey the, and we do not walk in the spirit, it has devastating consequences spiritually, doesn't it? It often destroys families. It'll destroy your Christian life. It'll destroy churches. Churches are not going to do the things that they need to do. People are going to go to hell because of it. It's serious stuff. You say that was mean, but no, when we go away from the things of God, there are eternal consequences as a result of it. And so God often, whenever something new like this was starting, when they're going in a new era, we would see these kind of things happen to just show them how serious this is. But we just don't take these things seriously. I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think sin's a big deal. You know, what do you, what do you make such a big deal about it? Well, you don't think it's a big deal because you're vile, you're sinful, and you just don't trust God. Okay, to a holy God, these things are a big deal. And you know what? Why don't you just trust him? Why don't you just trust him? Well, I, I'm not capable of being that good. 
Well, how about you just do it from the heart, walk in the spirit, and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Ask for mercy every day, and God will be gracious. Where sin abounds, grace will much more abound. But when you take advantage of the grace of God, that's pretty bad. That, that's, that's pretty wicked. You shouldn't do that kind of thing. So these tribes, they did, they did right in obeying Joshua, just like they did Moses. So we're going to see in this book, while they have some slip-ups along the way, for the most part, this is a book of victory. We get to see a generation that was able to see and experience the results of being obedient to God. And so while the Bible is full of major judgment against Israel, we get a glimpse in the book of Joshua of where the heart of God was and what he wanted to do with Israel. God wanted to do great things with them. God wanted to bless them. God wanted them to not have any diseases. God didn't want them to have a barren woman among them. God told them how they could basically have paradise on earth. And you know what? If we would just completely obey the word of God, we'd have paradise on earth, wouldn't we? But at the end of the day, we know we can't. So you know what we do by faith? We, we trust God. And one of these days, you know, he will glorify us. And we will be able uh, at, at that point in, in the millennium. But this should be a reminder, though, for us not to make the mistakes that Israel did. God wants us to be victorious and God wants us to be successful as a truth, a church. And we are, we are guaranteed to have it if we'll just obey him. We just, we, we've got to obey him. But you know what? And we're going to see examples of this too. You know, it's easy to obey God when it goes along with what we want to do. It's easy to go uh, to obey God when it's easy situations. You know where people mess up? It's when things get difficult and when faith is required. Okay. But when those days come and we're going to have those days, that's where we got to stand strong. That's where we got to look at these things and say, you know, we're, man, this stinks. You know, we got to obey God. We're, we're going to do this, even though we're pretty sure it's going to hurt us. I'm telling you, it won't hurt us. And it'll never hurt us if we obey God. So with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this, uh, this uh, story we have and these examples in the book of Joshua. I pray you'll bless this study through this book. I pray we'll... Uh, apply these things correctly in our life that'll help us have a better understanding of the scriptures. And I pray we'll uh, make the necessarily necessary life applications in our own life. Uh, and uh, I pray you'll help us to be victorious and obedient Christians in your name. We pray. Amen.